So they don't want to go down the sexy route because we've spent our lives being objectified. And so I think when people are getting towards late 40s, 50s, 60s, it's more about leaning into their own sense of style and a sense of elegance and chicness and they're discovering who they are in terms of being able to wear the clothes that they want to wear, not dressing for a male gaze. Hi, everybody. This is Diane Gilman, formerly the Queen of Jeans, but about to talk about it again. Now the proud host of my own podcast, Too Young to Be Old. And today we have somebody fascinating. Emma Lightbound is actually a presenter as well as a stylist at QVC UK. That was the first European station I went to when I took my DG2 middle-aged jean business international. And I was just saying to Emma that I, I realized a big lesson from QVC UK, which was it is up to the woman how she views herself aging. So First of all, Emma, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thrilled to have you. And um, this brings back so many memories of QVC UK. I do want to say that when I went there, they had never sold a middle-aged jean before. Actually, nobody had. But in America... You know, very much like the trench coat is your endemic piece of fashion, and people will always think English, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Burberry, right? Um, The jean is so very all-American. And even though I went to the UK, it was about 15 years ago. So it was the height of denim fashion. It was everybody needed jeans in their closet for sure. In America, I realized that the American woman wanted to not give up sexiness. The American woman saw a jean as a symbol of youth that could carry her forward into her 50s, 60s, and obviously the way I fit it out, 70s and beyond. That was not so for the English woman. Explain to me what you think a woman over 50 in the UK wants for her image. And you can split it up between city, like London or Liverpool, and country. But I, I'm, I'm really dying to know from a true English woman... Oh, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's really lovely to chat to you. I think the English woman is, as you say, quite divided depending on where they live, whether they live in a big city, whether they live in the countryside, whether they live in the north of England, the south of England. I think there are very much different kind of pockets of fashion styles and fashion cultures. But I definitely think the jeans here are seen as much more of a casual item in the wardrobe rather than a dressed up fancy item. And particularly, I think, for women who are moving into their 50s and 60s and 70s, they... There aren't as many brands here that are creating jeans for midlife. So a lot of the times, jeans are often seen here as a kind of unicorn fashion item, the one that takes you so long to find and it's impossible to get the right cut and the right shape. So I think gradually they have moved out of people's wardrobes as they've got older. But there are brands starting to come through now that are definitely doing um, jeans that are not just low rise and super baggy and for the you oh. know millennials and the the gen z's <laughs> that that super baggy thing is so impossible because you know when we age we do shrink a little i did and 
you wind up being lost in an article of clothing like that. I mean, you almost have to be perfect and six feet tall and super thin so you can wear a little crop top with it to balance it out. But we did very conservative cuts, a boot cut that was fitted through the thigh and a skinny that was not so skinny, but fitted all over. And I based it all on my own body and what my body went through as I aged and I lost my hormonal balance. So it was much bigger in the waist, a little lean through the um, thigh, pretty generous through the hip, and it really had a universal fit. And then we put a lot of spandex into it. But what we found in America was, number one, it was a big connection back to your youth to be wearing a jean. Women had not had any opportunity to wear denim in America until I invented the DG2 jean because I did it in proportions that no big manufacturer would adopt. I believe me, I knocked on a lot of doors and said, I think I have the best idea since popcorn. And the answer was always, uh, no. But what I did find was American women wanted to wear makeup after the age of 50. They wanted to look sexy after the age of 50. They wanted to talk about it. Um, So it was not only a connection to youth. What I found in England was, and there's something in your bio that says, you know, you're really big on being outdoors. And, oh, my God, of course, it's so gorgeous in England. Um, I think that the gene for the English customer was almost that. I'm going to take a walk in the park with the dog in the morning and the afternoon, and it's going to be wet and raw, and a jean is good to wear. Do you think that the English women, even do you think in London, they connect a gene to sexiness, or you think not? I think it depends on age. I definitely think from kind of later on in life, 50s or so, I think jeans are a practical piece more so than a sexy piece. And I think a lot of um, what's very much on trend now in terms of jeans is we're really moving away from skinny jeans and moving into much more interesting cuts, more flattering cuts. And so I think we're in a kind of pivotal point with denim here in the UK where you've got the younger generation who've adopted all of these different shapes and styles and an older generation who would have previously always gone to straight to a skinny that are now going, okay, but I don't know how to translate that shape of a jean into my wardrobe and what shoes do I wear with it and how do I style it and what goes with it. So I think we're in this quite transitional period with denim, but I think it's not necessarily a piece that's always been seen as a sexy piece for a woman. It's such a difference and it was such a cultural uh, shock to me that I had to change my selling technique and what I said because it it was not going to resonate with the um, English customer. And, you know, the other thing I felt, too, was that English women past a certain age do not want a lot of attention shined on them. Because I remember I was on Sloan Street, And I saw a woman in an outfit that just drove me crazy. And I actually think it was Chanel, but it was a Chanel tweed jacket, all trimmed in fringed denim, the jacket. Oh my God, it was spectacular. And I remember having my phone out and going to take a picture and she actually started screaming at me like, I don't want, don't do that. Don't do that. In America, they'd say, oh, hold on a second, let me put some lipstick on it and let me pose, <laughs> right? So is there that sense of propriety past 50 for women in England? Is it a sense of 
Um, you want to control your own image. I'm not sure, but I really upset that woman. So explain this to me, please. (laughs) (laughs) So I do think it's a sense of propriety. I think it's a wanting to kind of have the ownership over yourself. And I think that's why a lot of women are not wanting to be objectified. So they don't want to go down the sexy route because we've spent our lives being objectified. And so I think when people are getting towards late 40s, 50s, 60s, it's more about leaning into their own sense of style and a sense of elegance and chicness and they're discovering who they are in terms of being able to wear the clothes that they want to wear, not dressing for a male gaze because we're kind of past that thing now. We're like, we don't have to dress for the male gaze anymore. We're all good. We don't need to address so that you can objectify us. We can dress so that we just feel fabulous. And I think that is key. I love it. Wow. How interesting. And do you notice, and this is just an aside, but it has so much to do with female society. I feel that when I watch the Emmys, the Oscars, it's so different from BAFTA. Like for the British award shows, the gowns are elegant. The gowns are very measured. They're very thought through. The hairstyles are um, very much pulled back. Uh, when you get to American award shows, it's shameless. I mean, and they it's so shameless that they're even showing the worst, most inappropriate dresses first before they even show the good ones. Do you find that sexuality is pushed to the limits for women's images at award shows in England. And do you guys ever look at us and see our award shows, like the Grammys and think, what is going on there? My God. Oh, I think we have our fair share of those moments too. Do you? Yeah, I think so. I think there's definite people on all red carpets that are out just to shock and make headlines and it's how can I get all of the media attention on me it's obviously a pre-planned thing with their stylist to go we need some headlines this is what I'm going to wear and I think I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a, a UK versus America thing I definitely think we have our fair share of red carpet moments here where there's definitely a lot more on show than you were expecting <laughs> Okay, because I'll tell you what, it's it's getting to the point where someone's just, one woman is going to come into one of those shows with three bandages on the front of her, and that's little band-aids, that's going to be it. It's getting pretty crazy. So the other thing I want to ask is about shopping trends and habits in the UK. When, when I decided that I was going to try to take my American QVC HSN business international, of course, England was the first stop on that ladder because we spoke the same language, I thought, or kind of. Um, I found a lot of very different rules that I tried to change within the QVC studio that um, were not going to change. So one thing I would say is that it seems to me that the English culture is rooted in tradition rather than transitioning. I had, I felt, a better way to sell my jean that would have doubled or tripled sales. But it was, I always heard the same thing. That's not the way we do it here. <laughs> so, yeah. So I always think that if somebody like me decided to settle down in retirement in a beautiful Cotswolds English village, I would be the first one that would want to change everything and it would constantly be, yes, of course you wear wellies and of course you wear a heavy coat and a big hat because that's the way we do it here. Do you think that fashion and fast fashion rotates as quickly in England as it does 
in America. I think personally, you guys almost, in, you invented with Mary Quant in the 60s, fast fashion. But I want to know where that is today and what is the chasm between being young and trendy and being past 50 and reassessing your look, your image, and the message you give to the world. So I definitely think fast fashion is a big thing here in the UK, which is unfortunate because I don't think it's great for the environment. I don't think it's great for people's self-esteem. And I really don't think it's great for young independent designers who inevitably get their work stolen by a lot of these big fast fashion brands. Oh. And, uh, they have a tendency to find young designers, rip off their pieces, and uh, the designers can never do anything about it. They don't have the money to sue them. And so I think it's really sad that this has become the culture. Wow. There's definitely a lot, a very big influx here of fast fashion brands and they are being heavily marketed and heavily promoted. And obviously you see a lot of them going around on social media. I do think it's quite interesting that the older um, ladies of the UK are predominantly more focused, in my opinion, on quality rather than fast fashion trends. So they're much more likely to buy from British made brands, brands that are um, UK based or that are working to certain quality practices because we've all been there. We've all bought a fast fashion thing. You've put it in the washing machine once and it's just disintegrated. Yeah. And I think when you are somebody who's got to the point in life that you have more expendable income, you have that money available. It's not like you're in your 20s struggling to pay your rent each month and going out every night of the week. I think you're much more likely to invest in better brands and therefore better quality pieces. So I do oh. really like that, that the, you know people are spending a bit more. I know that you said that we are far more obsessed with the royal family in America than you guys are in the UK. I mean, the stories are rampant every day. But the one thing I will say is we are so impressed by Kate's sense of style. However, that I believe is a style that's very English. In other words, she, because she has such a lean body and so much presence, she can almost wear older lady clothes than what's her age and come off looking chic. How does the average UK woman view Kate's style and how many women are so influenced by Princess Kate, or if she's not a princess yet, she'll be a queen soon enough. But how how do they feel about it, and do they want to emulate that, and do the things that she wears become instant bestsellers? So I do think they do. I think there's always going to be a market for any of the royal family. It's always been... Uh, a type of person that is looked up to in terms of their fashion sense. You've only got to think of Princess Diana and how much everybody loved what she wore. We're all still oh, yeah. talking about the revenge dress now and it's, you know, 30 oh, yeah. years long. We love it. Um, I think Kate is very stylish. She does dress older than her years, in my opinion, but she's very chic and very elegant. And I think part of that is that she's never been very trend led she's always been about being chic and elegant and very much dressing the part of her role within the royal family and the fact that eventually she will be queen i think she could be a bit more adventurous i think she's like you say she's got an incredible figure she could wear a bin bag and she would look incredible yeah. But I think she's not very adventurous. She sticks between these very certain parameters. But there are lots of pieces that she does wear that then instantly become hits. She wears a lot of British brands. She wears a lot of brands like Hobbs uh, and Tempoli and pieces like that. And so, you know, they are 
really well loved here. They are such great brands and you know that you're getting amazing quality with them. Because I know in America, the last first lady that we really followed was Michelle Obama. And she was a big um, fan of middle price brands like J. Crew. And if she wore it, and she actually discovered Alexander Wang and made him famous uh, by wearing his, his collection. Um, so we admired her because she spent not that much money to look great, and it was totally relatable to the average American woman. Then um, we had Melania Trump, who I will never forget, for. Uh, a day of meeting the Pope, the holiest man on earth, supposedly, with sacrificing, you know, uh, not worrying about anything physical, everything was spiritual. She wore a $75,000 Dolce Gambana coat, $75,000 with big fake flowers all over it. And uh, that was just the coat. That didn't even include the dress or the $50,000 Birkin bag or $100,000 Birkin bag. So we went from somebody we really admired and trusted in terms of taste to somebody where it was I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Now, from my point of view, as rich as Kate Middleton is, being connected with the wealthiest family on earth, um, that never comes across like that is not the kind of superiority where you're beating the public over the head. How do you think Kate Middleton translates herself to the real woman? in the UK and frankly the world because she really is well loved and I think people in America are crazy over her because of her beauty and her style but also now everybody is so concerned that there is something not right. Um, how do you think she manages to just walk that line because she does. I mean, she wears some pretty expensive stuff, but she never comes off with that attitude of, oh my God, she's wearing $250,000 worth of clothing to the Vatican today. Something has got to be wrong with that. How does she do it? I do think she's a lot more down to earth than that. So I think she tends to wear that really nice mix of brands. So if she's doing a red carpet or a really special event, then yes, she will be in a very expensive gown. But then on her day to day press that she does and events and that type of thing, she's not wearing as expensive brands. She is wearing a mixture of the more attainable brands, which then so makes smart. her... Yeah, it makes her more relatable to the general public. And I also think the media helps in the way that she is portrayed. She's obviously, she comes across really well, very down to earth, very genuine, very friendly. And the media genuinely do like her. I think our problem here is that we don't just have a princess. We have a couple of princesses. And I think that we are very like the media here is very biased towards Megan and I actually really like Megan I think Megan's great she's beautiful she has excellent sense of style yes. yes everybody's awful about her and I think I just think it's wrong I think it's wrong she's a young woman there's no need to be so writing such disgraceful things about her Come for me if yeah, you want. And, I will stand up for her. I like her. <laughs> you know, um, she's got a long life ahead of her, and I know they're trying to mend their image, which I'm sure at some point they will. I love Megan's style. I loved her bridal gown as well. I thought it was so spare and so all about a crisp, cool, 
shape and not because I remember that the one thing that always set me off about Princess Diana was that wedding dress. And then afterwards in America, we actually brought the designers for Diana's wedding dress <clears throat> onto QVC HSN to do a diffusion collection. But I thought, oh my God, that dress is so busy and so like frothy and scala ah, those big sleeves and uh, she took care of that in the years afterwards once she was able and understood how to control her style. I think but yeah, like, what people have her own say about things when she had yeah. more control. I don't think she had a lot of control in that wedding dress. Yeah. And you know the interesting thing is if we have to equate, of course there is no royalty in America, but the first lady is usually considered somebody you really looked up to. Um, we also had first ladies like uh, Hillary Clinton, who, quite frankly, didn't really care. Their whole mission was getting political stuff done. And the public did not like her because of that. They they wanted more glamour, more more designer discovery. What I think is Kate's real secret, too, is because she is so lean and has such a perfect body for fashion, she can wear older styling. And, you know, there's a lot of styling, and I'm just going to bring up Chanel as, as an object of discussion. If you've got the wrong shape, but you insist on wearing a Chanel jacket, you can really look old, overweight and frumpy. But if you're if you've got that perfect body, you suddenly can do anything you want with it and make it very, very chic. I think Kate Middleton's secret is she can wear older ladies fashion, but because of the way she puts it on that streamlined body, it 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 just does not come out translated as old, but your over 50 female population can relate to it and say, I could wear that. I think personally, that is her genius. I agree. I agree. It's the fact that she can relate to such a wide audience yeah. because she's wearing pretty conservative clothes. There's yeah. never anything revealing. There's never anything too flashy or showy. So it relates to a huge wide audience. And the fact that she's then wearing affordable brands, I think she's just absolutely got it nailed. So this, talking about affordable brands, last questions. Um, in America, everything about fashion has changed because of the way we shop and the way we stopped shopping. So malls are closing up everywhere. Um, big stores like Macy's closing down 150, 250 stores at a time. And, and granted, they probably had too many. We are a female society converting to almost 100% shopping online. And that's me. I don't ever go into a store anymore. I always tell myself I don't have the time. I don't find it relaxing because the salespeople are all like hungry wolves, you know, waiting to jump on you. Um, so we see a lot of the empty storefronts. I read yesterday that Tom Brown, one of my favorite UK brands, has just gone into bankruptcy and all their stores. And I believe they had 150 stores or it was a 50 around the UK are going to probably be shuttered. You and I are both veterans of teller retailing where women will buy from a picture. In this case, it's television. It's a living breathing, moving image, and you're there to explain it to them. But have you had the conversion to online fashion shopping in the UK that we've had in America? Massively. 
massively. Really? Our high streets are... So we have two kind of areas of shopping here. We have the high street, which is generally a main center of a city or a main town that's got all the shops in. And then we also have shopping centers or the mall. And in both areas, there are masses of empty shops where brands have closed down. Some of our major retailers have uh, gone under or have moved to online only. And yeah, it's a huge, huge thing here as well. I think part of this stems from the pandemic where everybody was at home and they shopped online and then they realized it was just easier to shop online. But also, I think cost of living crisis here in the UK has meant that people are spending less and that it's actually easier to find more affordable fashion online because it might not necessarily be that you're buying from different brands. It's that you're buying from the brands in a different way. You're not necessarily having to go into store and rummage through a sale rail to find a bargain. You can find that sale piece really easily on the company's website or on one of the flash sale websites. So I think people are just trying to buy things in a more affordable way to save money because of the cost of living. And and do you think that cl- includes the woman over 50? Do you think that those women have transitioned in their minds and said, okay, uh, I used to love to shop and just sort of waft through a store and dream about wearing this or that, but now I just go online. I know that's me, but I'm shocked if that's the real deal for England as well. I thought you would be too rooted in tra- in in just the opposition to heritage being overturned but wow that's incredible yeah it is it's very it's very very different i do think there are still a large portion of society who do prefer to go and shop and physically touch things you know as women we're very tactile creatures a lot of yeah. how we shop is by touch and by a feel of fabric but So many of it is now just done online. There's so many people who prefer to shop online now because I love shopping in person, but I won't try on when I'm out. Yeah, exactly. Bring them home and try them on at home because I want the mirror that I trust, the mirror that I see myself in every day. That's going to give me a realistic view of what this outfit looks like. Your mirrors in your changing rooms they're going to lie to me. Also, it's always too hot in the changing rooms. I don't like the lighting. I don't want to queue up. All of it. It's just not a nice experience. They need to overhaul that experience of shopping in person and trying on in person if they want us to actually do it. They need to make the changing rooms nicer and bigger and more relaxing rather than this kind of very stressful, cramped, sweaty situation that happens. Yeah, same for America. And I think also even beyond that overhaul, there are a lot of retailers and Macy's is one of them that needs to and should have 15 years ago, 20 years ago, reconsidered online shopping and said, okay, this is not going away. This is not an aberration. We better make our websites look Incredible. I know that I was on QBC, HSN, QBC International as well, the shopping channel in Canada, the shopping channel in Australia. I was there at the height of teleretailing when people were getting a little tired, perhaps, of brick and mortar shopping, but online shopping and not caught on yet. So the idea of marrying it all together with television and the people that created the brands and presenters coming on and explaining it, that was just magic. Now, I I, I think when I think about just going into a store like Macy's, I don't think, and I worked three blocks away from Macy's. I don't think I've gone into a Macy's in 25 years. I just found it not a great experience. So um, I ask you as a clothing, as a closing, because I can see that there are so many places where American women and English women 
touch and meet in the middle and agree. Where do you think fashion is going? And where do you think fashion is going for the 50 plus woman? I genuinely think that we are moving towards a much better place, a much bigger, better place of freedom and visibility. And I hate the idea that women get 50 and become invisible. I'm not 50 yet. I'm in my 40s. But I find the older I get, the more I know who I am. I know what works for my body. And bluntly, I don't care about other people's opinions anymore. They are nonsense. When I was in my 20s, I needed this confidence because in my 20s, my body was cracking and I could have worn anything. Whereas now I'm not and that's fine. But I think there's lots of women now who are moving to this place of, I don't want to dress for the male gaze. I don't need to. It's, you know, not something that I need to do. I'm going to dress for myself. I'm going to wear the things that I like. I'm going to experiment. And I actually think as much as social media has its downfalls, there is this incredible community of women online showcasing their everyday outfits and the things that they wear that are just absolutely fabulous and out there. And that's what we should be embracing more of. It's about finding the things that you like, whether that's bold prints or bright colors or classic dressing, heritage dressing, if that's your style, and just running with that and feeling that freedom. I really think that that's where we're moving to. And I am quite happy to be part of that charge. That's amazing. And just to conclude this, in America, I I don't know if this is true for you, but for us in America, COVID was a huge game changer. We started working remotely from home. We found we could be as productive in a pair of sweatpants and a sweatshirt as we could in an uptight office suit. And we didn't want to change that. And so I would have to say for America, what I think is the future is um, it's not going to be about career clothing. That was the 80s when women were really breaking into the corporate life. I think it's about how cozy, how comfy, how washable, how practical, And how relaxed can you get away with? And that, I see it on every street corner in New York City. If you didn't know you were in New York City, I mean, this whole thing of sex in the city and all those outfits, that's that's great as entertainment and, and one bit of sparkle in a whole time period. But we are comfortable now. And we are not going to give it up. That's what I would say would be the battle cry for fashion in America. So altogether, this, I could go on talking to you forever. This was (laughs) fascinating. I loved it. And I wish you all the success in the world. Emma Lightbone has been uh, a presenter on QVC UK for two years now. And I can see why they took you on. You're just so good with words and you know so much about fashion and the whole ethos of it. Emma, thank you so, so much for being part of Fashion Thursdays, Too Young to Be Old. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fabulous. Thank you so much for listening to Too Young to Be Old podcast. The episode may be over, but the fun doesn't have to stop here. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at The Diane Gilman, or visit our website, thedianegilman.com. If you like the show, leave us a rating or a review, and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And until then, don't forget, age is just a number. Together, will prove that we are all too young to be old.